Hello everyone, welcome to Homemakers Radio. I'm Mrs. Sherman and I'm broadcasting from one of the rooms in the manse and I hope you get a few things done while you listen today. And if you are new here, please click the link in the description box and go to the place where I have embedded this video where I also leave a brief summary and some pictures and a few other things, maybe some links you might be interested in. Also, I have mentioned that you could leave a comment, but that's over there. I don't have comments on the channel. I just am too busy to monitor too much social media. All I can handle right now is what I'm doing here and my phone. And so ladies, I'm going to start out by saying get ready. Get yourself dressed up as best you can for the home. It's the most important thing. I was reading in Linda Lichter's book here, uh, Simple Social Graces, also goes by the title of The Benevolence of Manners for, for one of the other editions that was printed. And she had a section in here on, this is about the Victorian home. This is history of the Victorian home and the Victorian family and she did a lot of research into their letters and their diaries, their art, their architecture, their toys, their funerals, their weddings, their clothing and their conversations, their friendships, their marriages and tried to find out what it was like to to have uh, a little more social uh, stability you know uh, things are so changeable these days and so she went back and found out all about life and I would recommend that if you read this uh, it's not for children she's pretty harsh in what she says sometimes it's a little too much too explicit in some things but she's always criticizing the modern era and she goes back to the olden days where she talks about how the home uh, was kept in such a wonderful manner because of the respect that people had for the dwelling. And the dwelling held the people that were the most important thing. It wasn't all about the house. It was all about a place where people dwelt and spent more time than we do today and she had a chapter on the home as a hotel and how it had kind of turned into a hotel where people just spend some time there recovering while they go somewhere else and this is uh, what hit me about this was how many people get up in the morning and take their children to a school bus at seven in the morning where their children ride for an hour and spend most of the teachable productive moments of the day somewhere else and women as well and men uh, going somewhere else having their brain virtually drained and by the time they get home they're exhausted and can't think very clearly but uh, and bury themselves in other social things just for the relief of it and so this is a good book to figure it out she has a chapter on page 221 called home as a hotel and I would recommend that you read that then she goes into how it wasn't the 50s that called women uh, just a housewife it happened far far beyond that beyond that 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 was in the in the making to demean her uh, role at home so that few women would really want it and I was listening this morning also to someone's broadcast on uh, YouTube where she was talking about the history of public education on how it was a statement and I don't know who it was written by uh, where she talked about and I might be able to leave a link for you if I can find it uh, where these people's goals in establishing the first public school was not to create anything uh, educated person but but a person that could be controlled and it was it was actually written down in some of their foundation papers and uh, so we have to be careful with the home too that we don't turn that in just to a place like a hotel just place we're temporarily staying while we go out and do something great somewhere else because what happens here in your home is greatness indeed and that's one of the reasons I tell you to get up and get dressed and and treat it like it was the most important place you will go today and also keep yourself a journal or a diary of the experiences of the home and and make some observations because the next generation may want to know more about it and maybe you're experiencing it firsthand and you do need to write some of it down. 
I also have uh, some words I want to go into because of course you know I'm a veteran homeschooler and now I'm homeschooling <laughs> all the others that missed out on all of you that missed out on it you get to be homeschooled because I'm I can't quit I have to go and look up things and uh, and it's sad when there's nobody here <laughs> to tell about but this was about borrowing words from other languages and why the English does that. Our language, sadly, is not as expressive as, say, the Russian language or the French language. We have to borrow those words, and they have been borrowed for a long time. But the reason that I got interested in it is my son was here, and we were singing together. He comes once a week, and we, we just re-homeschool, and we learn new things, and we, we, uh, we do things. We do exercises he teaches me uh, self-defense and he teaches me all the things that I paid for to teach him for him to teach he, I get music lessons and I get drawing lessons and all the things that uh, I didn't have time for but I I had him take courses in those you know some of them were at the home but uh, one of them was a song we were singing and um, he he always liked the music of Bach so he had uh, shown me this tune and I said oh I know what that is that's O Sacred Head because the music of Bach was used in this uh, hymn called O Sacred Head and the second verse in that song was what language shall I borrow uh, to thank thee dearest friend for this thy deepest sorrow and I thought oh my goodness why would it say what language shall why did the poet say what language shall I borrow so I looked up the purpose of borrowed language and it was when there weren't any descriptions or words in your own language you borrowed it from another language and you just integrated it into your own language and so let's let's go through and there are a lot of them but I'm just going to read a few just because it's interesting to me Okay, the word very. This despised yet commonly used adjective comes from the old French veri, which means true. Now, the reason it's so despised is because everyone uses it all the time, very. <laughs> this is very this and very that. And it means true. And if you remember in um, the Gospels, Jesus often said, verily, I say unto you, or verily verily truly truly I say unto you and uh, we use it way too much it says this despised yet commonly used adjective okay so dollar this comes from the ch check word uh, though Dutch its roots are connected to the origins of the mint itself a factory coin a factory where coins and currency is produced um, so here's another one court. In French, this means the king's resident and was often the place to which someone was called in order to respond to accusations. Now, a court also, uh, if you look up the history of a court, it's where you would go to plead something or you would go to uh, to get authority to do something. And it's a very important word in our language and we use the word court. Um, such as you know you shouldn't court those ideas and um, so here's another one zero this comes from the Arabic in fact many of our words related to numbers mathematics and trade can be traced back to Arabic our numbers are Arabic um, so extensive is English's borrowing habit that it prompted the rephrasing of an earlier quote by James Nichol English doesn't borrow from other languages. English follows other languages down dark alleys, knocks them over, and goes through their pockets for loose grammar. <laughs> That's very clever. So I thought you might be interested in that, and you might look that up too uh, for other borrowed phrases. I don't have a whole hour to talk to you today, but I wanted, I just had some things on my mind. I uh, am a friend with a woman whose daughters are. Uh, in their 20s and they have cars and she made a rule for them she was a homeschool mama and she made a rule for them that they would always take their own vehicle because if whatever they were going uh, to didn't turn out too well or they felt um, unwelcomed or 
in danger or entrapped or something, they had a way out. They could get in their vehicle and go home. And I have adopted that too. Um, that way, if, for instance, you go to something uh, as a, a vital woman, uh, people want to, you know, take me somewhere, want to do something for uh, for the elderly. <laughs> they want to take me somewhere and I'll say, oh, no, thank you. I'll just meet you there because I have stops to make on the way home. <laughs> and and uh, so I avoid it because if you get, I have learned from the time I was uh, old enough to socialize and, and sent to someone's house for a birthday party, you are uh, you have to endure some things until someone comes and gets you or takes you home, and you might not be having a very good time. And I remember in the uh, maybe the 70s that the mothers were saying, if for any reason you want to come home, call me and I'll come I'll come and get you because of this situation, getting in a situation where maybe you didn't feel well or you were tired or the social activity was uh, making you feel kind of alien or anything like that or you just didn't like the program and so I have adopted that too and I would encourage you all no matter what your age to be independent to take your own vehicles and your own transportation to wherever you go so you can leave when you want to don't wait uh, and I was from the old times where you waited for your husband to come and pick you up from a baby shower or some other event and it could get quite awkward if you'd spent the whole time there maybe feeling a little uneasy about something, not saying that would always happen, but uh, sometimes in groups, things don't always work out. And I would like to just talk a little bit about being independent. And one of the things I've learned over the years, and you probably have too if you're vital, and that is that you're just better off uh, being independent and as far as groups go one-on-one -on -one is just the absolute best I know some people think it'd be wonderful to have a ladies Bible class but you're, you're going to be dealing with a group and you're going to be dodging a lot of different uh, personalities and voices and things and, and while you're trying to coordinate all that kind of miss out on the whole study sometimes uh, trying to keep people uh, from going off on different subjects or from offending someone else maybe that they don't know and so it's just one-on-one -on -one is just better if you've got someone that that wants to come and meet with you uh, that just one person is actually better and uh, that way there's no competition in the conversation and I learned a long time ago that if there was more than one if there were more than one uh, there would be kind of a it's impossible to talk to more than one person at a time and really look them in the eye and, and talk and concentrate on what you're saying uh, because they have different ideas and also sometimes you'll get one that feels insecure in a group and tries to turn everyone against someone else and get a whole bunch of people thinking one way and it's just the craziest thing and so the one-on-one -on -one is better. Having your own vehicle is better. Uh, having your independence is very, very important. I was really impressed with this woman saying, telling her girls, now that you've got your license, you're never to go with someone else. You always go, you be the one, you always be the one with the car that does the driving, and then you decide when you want to come home. And, it, and such a thing has happened to me, even in my vital years, where I've gotten someplace maybe... A, an event that was going on, a ladies' tea or something like that, and I saw that uh, I I needed to go home and and get something done, and it was it was going on a little longer than I wanted to, and so I didn't have to wait for anybody to get in the mood to go home. I just uh, excused myself and left, and so I think this is really really important. I had written quite a bit about uh, talking, the way people talk, and how to. Uh, keep your mouth shut in groups because groups are different than going one-on-one. -on -one. Going one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you each get to talk as long as you want and pause and the other will take their turn. But when you get in a group, it's very hard to keep a group conversation going. And uh, not that there's a lot of silences, but that also it's possible that you might get either left out or talked over or voted out <laughs> by opinion on whatever subject you're talking about. So it's best just to remain as independent as possible. 
Now, I also wanted to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I had mentioned this movie, Princess Cut. I don't know if it was ever made into a book, but I noticed it was real amusing when I first watched it. I thought, that's an interesting movie. It, it was kind of cute, and it, it had a it had some uh, some adventure type things in it, like in the Wild West, and it and it had a little boy in it that um, had a slingshot, and just old. It was about a farm life type of family, and I thought, well, that's interesting. But the second time I watched it, I thought, how many bases they actually covered in this, and I wanted to express some of them to you. If I could, I'd write a little worksheet that would go with it to make people understand what's going on here. This is just not an entertainment. This is a lesson. And one thing that I liked about it was that they took two people that had already dated and uh, it didn't go anywhere for them. It was nothing but disappointment and they wanted to do it right this time. So uh, I liked that, that they took um, they took these two flawed people and let them have a new start in um, go back, go to the father and mother and ask for advice and and the young man asked uh, the father's approval before he made any attempt to befriend his daughter and but that's not saying that the young man did it right before they both had they both had dated and so that's one thing I liked about it is that they took two people that had already already been in the world already been through a lot of disappointments and um, helped them to do it so that it would have the right out outcome for them. And another thing that I noticed about it was that the main character, Grace, who was always looking for a husband, when she had any kind of problem with, with that pursuit, she would call a friend, uh, and then her friend sent her once to a counselor, and finally, when she was when she was at her wits end and broken down enough she went to her parents who were the best thing that ever happened because uh, she said you're not you're not gonna try one of those she said you're not talking about some arranged marriage are you and he, her father said no that's up to you the choice is up to you we'll just be here to uh, to protect you and to support you and uh, her her father, either her father or mother said, why don't you just quit dating, stay home and let God pick the husband. Well, then a little while later, this other uh, man who had never, when he had moved into this town, had not seen her anywhere but working in her parents' garden, having, uh, you know, baking with her mother, working on the farm with her father, and that's how he um, knew that she was there but he also had enough respect to go to the parents before she even had a clue that he might be interested and um and and i liked it about that too also these weren't perfect people and it's not a it's not a movie full of really ultra uh glamorous looking people um and somebody might question that but i i liked that too and that it was also in a rural setting, which I really liked. But I wanted to bring out a few things about it. Uh, and that is that the parents took their God-given uh, responsibility. And uh, some people might call it authority, but they weren't uh, extremely autocratic. They were disappointed. You could see the look on the, it, all these bases were covered, but you could see the look on their faces that they exchanged when one of the young men that she was interested in came to the door but would not come in not come in and sit down the father said could we sit down and have a talk and uh, he said oh no I was just on my way to the shake shop and I wanted to know if Grace could come with me it wanted to know if she would like to go uh, of course if, if it's okay with you but it wasn't a real um, it wasn't a very honoring way to treat the parents and the parents didn't like it you could tell because they they worried about her too and uh, because she was out too late and that's another thing too I would say no matter what your age if you're home and uh, you're living with your family do not stay out late nothing good happens after dark and uh, it, when you're away from home and also don't get the idea that because your parents don't want you out late that you could just move out and then you could be out late because there's nothing out there that will go on for a little while and you'll find out how empty that is uh, those people that are so excited for you to leave home they're not going to be there for you when you finally fall 
uh, and you become very lonely and you don't have anywhere to go, they're, they're not going to be there for you. And so stay home and stay under your parents' responsibility and let God uh, decide your future by showing the parents respect. Uh, you will find things will change. And the other thing about the parents I wanted to really emphasize is don't outsource your authority. Parents have a lot of trouble these days with feeling confident as parents that they are making the right decisions. But uh, And so they go around, they're just like their kids. They go to a friend, then they find a, a minister, and then they find somebody else they want to talk to, and they don't trust their gut instinct. instinct. And the basicness uh, of this that I've always followed is if you don't know what to do, and you don't know what decision to make or what to tell your children, your grown children, older children, if for some reason it makes you uneasy or it bothers you or you're not sure about it, then the answer should be no. Just say no. Just say, uh, we can't have that because I'm not, uh, I haven't fully uh, researched it. I haven't fully thought about this. And so we're just going to put it away and not, not do it until I have uh, looked into it a little bit more. And, and our parents used to do that too because the world was hitting them with some things they had never seen or heard of. There were now some movies out and there were uh, friends and parties going on that they had never heard of, uh, like slumber parties and stuff. But our parents would just say, uh, we, we want to think about this a little bit longer. And and they they trusted their own authority and responsibility. They trusted it. They didn't have to phone around and talk to people. And uh, but But just like uh, the children, we go to a friend and then we go to someone else and finally we decide uh, if it's something that has to do with you and your children then you get to decide and even if it seems like it's not reasonable if it bothers you if it's something you're not sure about you're allowed to say no and because years later you'll look back and say I wish I had trusted my own um, feelings about it because there was something about it that was bothering me. And in this movie, Princess Cut, uh, the mother said, I had a sleepless night, something like that, because there's something about this young man, Jared, that bothers me. She didn't say exactly what it was, but the point was it was showing how the parents were just kind of uneasy about uh, this friend. And so if if you feel in the least bit just a little bit off about something you're allowed to say no and parents I think the worst problem that parents have today is they do not know how to handle their own authority and I say don't outsource your authority God gave it you know there's a little scale in your brain <laughs> there's the right side and the left side and and uh, then there's the the middle part that's balanced and uh, if you're thinking about something your child wants to do or is doing or someone else is pulling at your child or luring them in some way uh, to think a different way than you, to make it do an activity or go away uh, from you, something like that, your brain is either going to uh, go on the downside of the scale or uh, or you're going to feel it's right or wrong or right. You're, it's either going to be one or the other. It's not going to be, if it's, uh, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, it's usually, uh, it's usually that that needs to be something you don't agree with if you can't figure it out. And uh, so that is one thing I really wanted to emphasize here because there are, as your children get older, especially if you're a homeschooler, these children are very attractive. They're likable. They're hard workers. Everybody wants them. Everybody loves them. They want to lure them out of your little congregation into their big congregation because they would they would go well with everybody and they'd be such a great example and they they virtually really want them but uh, and, and they're pleasant to be around but that doesn't mean that they can have them and yet I think ever since mine were little I noticed this attitude that if you had little children at home someone else thought they had a right uh, for them to be with them at their house or over at your house or which is nice you know it's nice that we have friends but uh, there was an attitude that was a little bit different than when I was growing up and that was 
well, you have kids, you're supposed to socialize with us. And, but that's not necessarily so. And the, the parents, you know, your children are your future, future social life. When they start getting married, having their children, buying their house and everything, their friends aren't going to be helping them. It's going to be you. They, you, you and they are the future social life for each other. And we need to keep it more that way. When everybody gets sick and we all help each other out, we have our own little worship service at home and nobody else is included. And this is where, uh, when push comes to shove, those people that lure your children out of the home want them to do social things away from the parents. And that's another thing that used to bother me too, is that uh, I saw so many really nice families and somebody else would just lean right over the mother and talk to the daughter or the son and say we'd like you to come to our whatever and leave the parents completely out and we made a rule that if we weren't invited you couldn't go and uh sometimes we did get uh sidetracked or or um tricked just because they're people can be very very smart and uh then I would think, well, wait a minute, uh, what am I doing? Uh, I, I let them go and I, <laughs> I, I, I forgot my rule. And they'll make you forget your rule, but when you go pick them up, you'll find out all the parents are there. Just you didn't get included. And so really be wily. Uh, there was a word, wiles, W-I-L-E-S, uh, which is what they are. Uh, when, they're, when they're trying to uh, change your children's values that they grew up with. We, we used to call them wily and it meant undermining uh, and uh, sneaky and um, uh, very untruthful and so but you also have to be smart too and you've got to learn that you you have an authority. You are the parent. You are the authority and uh, whether that means you're extremely strict or not, I don't. I don't know. I think you're going to uh, find it easier to love them and say, "I can't let you do that because I love you too much, and you, I see danger ahead, or I sense something not quite right." We'll just wait on the Lord. We'll just pray about it. And I've seen good things come, uh, you know, come around because of that. Now, one of these things in this movie, Princess Cut, that I really liked was. Uh, when Grace came home from that awful date, which her mother had actually warned her about, she said, I knew I knew someone just like that once, and she said it was the worst day of my life. Um, something about how this young man didn't work out, and he wasn't what she thought he was. And anyway, Grace came home from what she thought was going to be an announcement about uh, being engaged to her and it turned out that her so-called boyfriend was announcing an engagement to someone else and uh, when she came home her parents had been looking out the window for her they didn't really like her being out late and that's one thing I liked about the new uh, the new suitor who actually came to the parents he just came into the home <laughs> made himself at home and had played games with them at night and cooked with them and and just had you know he he wasn't taking her out and in the daytime, uh, she went with him and her brothers to different outings. But um, anyway, this family was pretty upset about her being out so late. When she got home, she was upset and saying that it was the worst day of her life and, and told her father what had happened. And her father said, sounds like the Lord kept you from a big disaster. And what a wonderful way to look at things when they don't turn out, when they've just, when you've been in the most embarrassing, even those of you who are vital, been in the most embarrassing situation, can look back on it and say, well, the Lord stopped me <laughs> from having success in, in that, and that was why that happened. And, um... So another scene that I really liked was, um that the father was talking to the mother and saying, who am I going to give my daughter away to? Because daughters, uh, the, the father gives the daughter away in marriage. He says, most young men haven't got a clue what it's like to be a real husband. And he was reading off some of the desirable attributes of a future husband. And um, trustworthiness was one of them. And 
understanding the needs of a family and th a lot of things in there if you want to go ahead and watch the movie but uh, he said he's, he was looking around and there were no young men that he would even uh, consider for his daughter Grace but his wife said but they're there she said because look what happened to us and you know that's another thing you can do is look at you and your husband uh, and say well uh, we were we were able to find someone and our son or daughter will be able to find someone but you've got to uh, not go around trying to pick them out from a social group or from the world because that's always a disaster and this movie covered so many of these bases that I didn't really realize it till the second time I thought it was a really cute movie at first but then I realized it's there's a lot of teaching in it and and they were playing a, a board game one night and just the family and so the brother asked dad do you think there's just one special person uh one perfect person uh that you have to find you know to get married and the father wisely said i don't think it's so much that one perfect person as to try to be the right person with the right character and then it will come to you and that is what i've been trying to say all this time when i teach a lesson on character that even for my uh, ladies Bible class it's all about us developing character according to scripture and uh, not worrying about everybody else uh, you know are they all going to do it too no it's just uh, developing good character and I did mention quite a few of the attributes of good character one of them of course being trustworthiness and so the other thing that I wanted to talk about was um, being careful what you say uh, in any kind of social group, even in the family. The more words you put out there, the more people have a chance to get confused, to grasp onto some kind of end of a sentence and go off on a tangent, and uh, to misunderstand. And so, as I said before in the previous video, that silence is often golden. And I will finish off my little discourse here. I only have a few more minutes because I've got something else going on. And it was called Home as a Hotel. And it is by uh, Linda Lichter. Oh. So... My grandmother would never have described herself as just a housewife, a phrase that appeared in the 20s, not the 60s. In the Jazz Age, the once exalted domicile that deposed high priestess had tended was becoming more of a hotel than a home. As the historian Ellen Rothman put it, the altar where the Victorian family worshipped devolved into a base of operations. And thanks to the latest technology, toys, it has even become a base for spying on our nearest and dearest. Almost any object from planters to coffee pots can conceal tiny cameras and recorders to catch abusive nannies, drug-using kids, and spouses. According to industry experts, business is booming. Now what she uh, went on to say was that there was this man uh, who turned the home into a place where everything was really efficient and uh, I've forgotten what his name was but there was a movie made about him called Life with Father I believe and uh, it was the, it was a movie where he had had the children all timing themselves into you know how long it took them to brush their teeth and and how long it took them to make a bed or to get dressed and he had this family he kind of turned the home into a factory and this was during the beginning of the industrial age and so that's another thing we have to watch out for we're homemakers but we're just making uh, an atmosphere in the home and this has a blessed purpose it's not just a place where you work and try to keep it clean and keep it properly decorated but it is a place of uh, where the, the mind is developed and the heart is developed and and the love between you all is strong and it's sad that it has devolved into just a place where you raise really nice children and other people think that they can uh, they can have them in their group or um, 
they can redo them, you know, and this happens a lot too when after they have been homeschooled, they want to go to work. And at work, you don't realize that they are reprogramming them in some way. So you have to have them prepared for all this. And this is something I'm gonna be talking about with my son as because he's older now, what would you say to young people to avoid this reprogramming when you get away from a wonderful home and they're starting to mock your uh, your family or the fact that you're very attached to your home and to your family? And what, what do we need to say to people to keep them grounded? And so ladies, I wish that I could talk a lot longer today, but you're lucky I got 36 minutes in. And until I can see you again on maybe some brighter subjects, I'll just remind you to stay close to Christ. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.